What's up guys? This video is for those of you who are looking to learn how to navigate GA4. Um, as you guys probably know by now, Universal Analytics is going to be gone by July 1st, 2023. So you want to learn how GA4 works and how it can help you. Luckily, there is so much more flexibility with GA4. So this video is going to share a overview on how to use and navigate GA4. Um, this is a private video that is available in my IG Growth Accelerator course. It's completely free um, and you can sign up for it below. The GA4 and Google Analytics videos are available in the bonus section. Okay, so with that said, I will cut to the other video and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we're just going to be hanging out in Google's demo account. This is a product-based business. It's their Google merchandise account. So I am going to switch over to another account because I want to go through blogs and how to analyze those analytics. So that'll be on a different account for a little bit of a different video. So um, let's get started here. So anytime that you log into Google Analytics, it is going to bring you to the home menu. Okay. And so this is just going to give you a breakdown of everything that's going on with your account. Honestly, I don't spend too much time here. It's just like a quick breakdown. Um, if you're interested, it'll give you lots of insights and recommendations. Once again, I really don't pay a whole bunch of attention to this, but um, you're more than welcome to. What's more interesting here is the report section. If you're going to click on reports, it's going to bring you to this um, page here. And then Similar to the homepage, it's going to give you a snapshot. I don't pay attention to this. Um, another interesting thing is real time, which will actually give you your users like in real time. This is really good for um, like testing your uh, events and different things like that. Um, it's something that I like to use, but once again, really not that important, really not that useful. It's kind of cool that you can see what's going on in your site in real time. But like, other than that, it's not that interesting. Um, so <laughs> it's important is this acquisition, engagement, and monetization. Now, before we even click on these, I want to explain what this means. This is kind of like Google Analytics version of the buyer journey. So acquisition is how people landed on your site. So did social media drive them? Did your email campaign drive them? Did they come from organic search from your blogs, like whatever this looks like, acquisition is going to show up here. Engagement, on the other hand, is going to say, okay, so once people landed on your website, what they do? And this can give you a lot of information on the quality of data or sorry, the quality of content that's available on your website. So if you have a slow load time, that's going to negatively impact your engagement. If you have blog posts that have nothing to do with your company, that's going to negatively affect, affect your engagement. So um, that's where engagement comes into play. Monetization has to do with the conversion. If you are a service-based business, there's a way to manipulate this to like kind of like set up conversions, um, which we'll talk about later on. But for e-commerce uh, businesses, this is super straightforward. This is like the actual meat and potatoes, like the sales that are going on in your website. So it's quite important for e-commerce businesses, less so important for service-based businesses, but you can kind of like manipulate it, like I said, so that it still kind of works for your business. But um, anyway, we're going to get into all that. So let's start with acquisition. Acquisition has an overview. Once again, like your homepage and the report snapshot, this is just going to give you a brief breakdown on what's going on. I don't pay attention to these. I like to look at user acquisition and then traffic acquisition. So there's not too much of a difference between these two. User acquisition is how many users were acquired onto the site. So traffic acquisition has to do with multiple users. So for example, if you are a brand new user to that website, you're going to be included in this number. If you are then go and you revisit the website, you are then going to be funneled into here. You will not be duplicated here. I hope that makes sense. So this is more for new users and it's like the first user. So like the first um contact you have with that website this one isn't the first contact so you can have multiple contacts with the same website so um, these numbers slightly differ but the traffic campaigns looks the same if that makes sense so like let's click on this guy here 
So you have direct, which is any time that somebody directly adds your like website URL link in their browser. So if I typed in Christanta digital marketing.ca, like right here, that would count as direct, uh, direct traffic. Um, if I went to Google and I typed in Christanta digital marketing and then clicked on the website, it would show up as an organic search. So think of direct as like people are going directly to your website. And then if people are Googling or using some sort of search engine that's a major search engine, um, they're going to show up in an organic search. Another time that Google Analytics will classify your um, channel as direct traffic is if they're not 100% sure how that traffic came about. It's actually kind of odd that uh, direct traffic would be so high for the Google merchandise store. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But typically, you'll see organic search um, as the biggest one. And then display would be anytime display ads are shown that people clicked on. Paid search is like Google ads. And then organic video would be people who watched a video and clicked over. So um, more typical ones that most companies are going to see are going to be ones like organic social, which would be traffic coming from, from your social media sites. Referral is anytime a non-major search engine refers traffic over to your website. So let's say, let's say Global News, which is like a news company channel thing in Canada where I live. Um, let's say Global News wrote an article about your company and they were driving traffic. They would count as a referral. Okay, so like if ABC News went and they wrote an article, same thing, right? It would be referral because it's not a major search engine. Um, major search engines will show up in organic search. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And then if you had email campaigns, then those would show up here as well. Um, so there are multiple ways that you can drive traffic to your website, and it's going to vary significantly across businesses. But typically, you're looking at direct organic search and social media and referrals. So if we notice, I just want to show you guys. So um, direct traffic accounts for 41,000 views. So now we're going to go head over to traffic acquisition. And you're going to notice that this number is higher because this is only going to count like the first user as a new user. So traffic acquisition is counting duplicates. So if I visit your website, then I leave and then I come back. Um, I'm going to be marked as two in traffic acquisition, but I'm only going to be marked as one in user acquisition. Okay. I hope that makes sense. So this number is typically going to be higher across the board because of that. Um, but you're going to notice this looks very similar to uh, user acquisition. There might be little differences here and there. Um, <clears throat> but it is something that is going to show you some different numbers. It's up to you which one you want to use. It's not a big deal either way. Um, if you are an e-commerce store, like typically you want people to keep coming back to your website to repurchase. So I would consider it a red flag for e-commerce stores if people are only visiting your website once and then not coming back. I think that would be a red flag because it means that you're not getting repeat purchases, which could be an issue with your customer service. It could be an issue with your product itself and a whole bunch of different other things. But so whether this is concerning or not has a lot to do with your business. Like I work with one business now where it's like literally their website's job is to get people onto their uh, clients' websites. So they have a really high user acquisition and their traffic acquisition are quite similar because they don't have a lot of repeat users, but their service is like designed to support that. So they're trying to get traffic onto their clients' websites. So um, in that particular scenario, it's really not that concerning. But like I said, in an e-commerce business or a business where you are looking for repeat purchases, then that can be a big issue. Once again, acquisition is just how you're acquiring people over to your website. So let's click over to engagement. Once again, you're going to have an overview. We're going to ignore that for now. What we're interested in here is events. 
So what's really cool about GA4 that Universal Analytics was not able to do is GA4, you can customize your events. This is really exciting. Um, I'm going to show you guys how to do this. But um, let's say you want to create an event for how many people reach your checkout page, or you want to create an event for how many people um, reach the add to cart page or something like that. You can actually set up events and tell Google Analytics when to trigger that event. So I'm going to show you how to do that in Google Tag Manager. So we're not going to worry about it right now. But I just want you guys to know that you can do a whole bunch of cool stuff with your events. You can customize them. And then Google Analytics actually gives you uh, tons of recommended events that you can set up as well. Um, so super interesting. But anyway, let's take a look at these ones here. So I'm just going to increase the rows because they say that they have 28 events set up here. They have a view promotion event set up. They have page view events set up. They have user engagement, um, new recent active user. Uh, click is one of those weird things where that means an outbound click off the website. So um, depending on your business, that might be a good or a bad thing. Um, then they also have ad shipping info, begin checkout. They also have San Francisco users. So you can set up a whole bunch of different um, events here and you can actually organize them and you can view them on this page. Next, we have conversions. So you can set up custom conversions. I'm going to show you how to do this in a minute here, but basically you can tell Google Analytics to consider this as a conversion event. So, so for example, Google Analytics has first visit set up as a conversion event. They also have predicted top spenders. They have ad payment info and begin checkout purchase, etc. So you can pick what your conversion events are if you are in an e-commerce store, then this is going to look pretty similar and it's going to be pretty straightforward. Service-based businesses can be a little bit different because um, like, let's say you are a hairstylist, a conversion event for you is likely to be a appointment booking or something like that. So um, it's different and it you have to manually set it up and it's a little less straightforward. Um, but with that said, let's go and look at pages and screens. This is really important if you have a blog. So this is going to give you all the different pages and screens that you have on your website. So they have 488 pages. So I'm just going to up this to 250 rows per page. Uh, keep in mind, if you guys want to download reports, you would click on share this report. So now I have a breakdown of all the pages and screens that they have on their website. So um, if I want to see how my home page is converting or my shopping cart or all those different things, it's going to break it down for me. So um, just looking at this really quick here, um, half as many people roughly visit the shopping cart as they do the home page. So 50% of people are never making it to the shopping cart. Typically, this wouldn't be a bad number. However, let's just say for argument's sake that this number is really low, then you would look at that and you would say, okay, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z to see how we can increase this number. And then you would go back into Google Analytics, adjust the time frame, and see if you improve those results, okay? Um, typically, when you're looking to improve your analytics, you're doing a lot of comparison and the data doesn't really mean much if it's standing on its own. So for example, let's say that Google Analytics put in a lot of effort and time and money to double this number. Um, if I'm looking at this after these changes have been implemented and this went from like 30% to 50%, I'm going to look at that as a success, okay? So a lot of you guys don't understand your Google Analytics because number one, you're not comparing it. Number two, you're not looking at it that often to analyze changes. And number three, you're not actively improving the results, okay? So this page is super important for analyzing your blogs. And this is what I look at for blogs in particular is I go and I sort this by the most viewed pages and I look at the top viewed blogs, okay? The second thing I look at 
is I look at average engagement time. And the reason why I look at this is good engagement time on average across industries is typically two to three minutes per blog page. Okay. So if people are cutting out after 32 seconds, they did not read your blog. Okay. They skimmed it. They said, this doesn't have the information I want. And then they clicked off. So that hurts your SEO and your rankings because people are clicking off your blogs. It's not um, like when Google's algorithm looks at this, they go and they say, okay, that blog isn't giving very good information. So let's suppress them in the rankings versus if you have blogs that, um, you know, are hovering around that two to three minute mark, which I don't see any here. So that's super concerning. Anyway, when Google sees that people are spending an above average time on your blogs, that signals to Google's algorithm that your blogs are really resonating with your target audience, and it tells Google to bump them up in the algorithm. So you will actually be rewarded for that. So in, in the case of KPIs, when it comes to blogs, I'm looking at average engagement time as my KPI, okay? So what's interesting about GA4 in comparison to Universal Analytics is GA4 actually doesn't give you a default bounce rate. You have to set it up manually. So that's kind of interesting. So if you're interested um, or you're used to looking at bounce rate, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult to find. And then next, let's look over at monetization. So for monetization, this is going to give you a breakdown of your revenue. So <clears throat> this is also going to show you how many people made a purchase and it's going to show you the average purchase revenue per user. Um, and it will also give you some other insights as well. Then if we click down at e-commerce purchases, then this is going to give you um, different item names. So this is going to give you the different products themselves, and it's going to give you a breakdown of the actual products that were sold. And then it's going to give you cart to view rate. And this is basically a breakdown of how many people were looking at that cart compared to people who also viewed that same product. And then it's going to give you e-commerce purchases, purchase to view rate, um, items purchased, and then item revenue. So you can pull a whole bunch of reports for this. If you're not sure what something means, all you have to do is hover around um, the title there, and it's going to give you a definition of what that item means. So for cart to view, it's the number of users who added a product to their cart divided by the number of users who viewed the same products. And then next, we're going to click on retention. Retention is comparing new users to returning users. So I touched on this before where returning users is important in terms of like loyal customers, people who are repeat customers and different things like that. If you're looking to increase sales, you're typically wanting to attract new users. If you're trying to increase customer lifetime value, you're typically looking at returning users. So and then next, we're going to go and click on demographics under the user section. So demographics is pretty straightforward and um, kind of useful from a common sense perspective. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, let's say you're a U.S.-based company, okay? Um, if most of your traffic is coming from India or Canada, that's probably a problem, Okay. So you want to be mindful of this in the sense of like, you know, where's your company based? Where is your target audience typically from? If there is a mismatch between these different things that can illustrate like big picture problems. It's usually not that big of a deal. I've never really encountered this with a company where, you know, they were targeting people in Taiwan, but they were meaning to target people in the United States, you know. Um, it happens more commonly on social media than it does in terms of organic search. But anyway, if you are, once again, more regional, you're targeting a specific city, this information is going to be important to look at. And then in terms of your marketing, if you sell feminine products and males are your biggest target base, that might affect, you know, your ads. It might inform, um, 
your marketing in the sense of like maybe you find that a lot of men are buying these as gifts for their girlfriends so even though your end user is for women it might be males who are buying it and so on right in most situations you will find that it's typically women buying male products for their boyfriends or husbands or whoever uh, just because women tend to make up 80 percent of purchases so the other thing that's really interesting here is users by interest, but we'll get into that in a second. And then you also want to look at age. So once again, common sense, like if you're selling, um, I don't know, products for old age and like anti-wrinkle creams, you're probably not targeting your campaign to 25 to 34 year olds unless it's like a preventative product. So you just want to make sure that these numbers line up with your target audience and who it is you're actually trying to attract. So now we're going to click on view interests. And this is really interesting in terms of paid advertising. So it's actually showing you who is showing up on your site and what they're interested in. So a lot of people that are visiting the Google merchandise store, they're interested in technology which would make sense because Google is known for their technology. So it makes sense that that demographic would be more interested. Um, it's attracting people who are interested in value. Um, it's attracting people who are interested in media and entertainment. So just to give you guys an example here, um, I have a client and they do blog posts and they target a younger demographic. So this section here is actually number one for them and what this told us is that we wanted to include more media and entertainment type content um, in their blog post so we wanted to make them more entertaining and so you can use this data to not only inform the content that's on your website but it, it would also tell us okay if we're going to run paid ads then we want them to be more centered around um, media and entertainment. We want these to be entertaining ads. And then we also want to consider targeting people who are really into movies and they they love movies, right? So you can use this information to inform your paid advertising as well, which personally I like to use it for. Um, but in terms of like blog posts and creating content and different things like that, I also like this section for so now let's click over on tech and we're just going to click on tech overview. So if you have an app, your app is going to make up a little piece of the pie here. Typically, most businesses are just going to have a website. So that's why web makes up 100% of their tech. Um, then it'll break down the operating system. So are people using Android or Mac, Windows, iOS, Chrome, Linux, a whole bunch of other things. Um, it's also going to say, okay, are they primarily visiting your website on desktop? Is it mobile? Is it tablet? So if mobile is the biggest way that people are consuming the information on your website, then you want to make sure that your website is mobile friendly. Um, I know some of it sounds really straightforward, but you'd be surprised. So here we see which browser uh, most people are using. Um, we can see that Chrome is the most used here. Not only is it a popular browser, but it's also a Google product as well. So that would make sense. And then once again, it's just breaking up the device category. Uh, screen resolution, that might be important to you. Um, but it's just going to give you a whole bunch of information in terms of the technology people are using in order to view your website. If we click on tech details, it's just going to give you a more detailed breakdown that you can look at as well. And with that said, that breaks down the report section or at least the bulk of it. Next, what we have is Explore. And this is really cool because you can actually create custom reports. Now, custom reports are going to look very different depending on the company that's using them. For example, one of my clients, they have client profiles and they wanted to separate their traffic according to those different client profiles. 
and the client profiles had multiple links. So what we did is we created custom reports that grouped all of those links together so that they could analyze what was driving the traffic, what was driving outbound clicks, a whole bunch of different things like that. You can do funnel explorations and different custom reports like that, which actually show how people are moving through the sales funnel. The next thing I want you to click on is advertising. This is only important if you run Google ads. So it's going to give you a quick breakdown of your Google advertising. And so what you can click on is all channels. And so it's going to give you a breakdown of your paid search, um, how much you spent on your ads, your cost per conversion, um, and then total revenue. Um, all good advertising is going to have a number that's higher here than it is here. Um, so the fact that they're spending more money on their advertising than they're making back, that's a really big problem. Um, and that would be something that if you are an e-commerce business, you would definitely be wanting to look into. So then they give you a model comparison and there's different ways that, that Google can acquire data for you. The most common cross channel to use is data driven. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. It's basically how they collect the data. Then for conversion paths, this is really important to understand what the early touch points are, what the mid touch points are, and then the late touch points are in a sale. So typically people are finding the Google merchandise store through organic search, um, referral, and then email, and then very few from organic social. When it comes to later touch points, you'll see that this looks like an entirely different process. So their paid search is actually playing a much bigger role and different things like that. So um, this tells me for their paid search, they could probably do um, more direct sales advertising because people are typically paying attention to the advertising later in the sales process. This also tells me that they're likely to be doing retargeting ads. So this can be helpful depending on what you're trying to do. And if you do have a sales funnel set up, this can show how effectively people are moving through the sales funnel, if things are working the way you want them to work, um, or if there are undercapitalized or utilized areas that you could be doubling down on to help move people through the sales funnel as well. So now let's click on admin. And so we're going to click on setup assistant. So this is where you would go to set up your data and link your Google ads and a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, you don't have to worry about setting up conversions, defining audience or manage users because that's done in the configure section, or it can be done in the Google Tag Manager. Then if we click on property settings, this is where you would name your property name. So typically that's just your business name. Um, you can add industry category, reporting time zone, and then uh, the currency. Then if we click on data streams, this is where you would connect to your website. So obviously the demo account has already been set up, but typically you would just add um, your website URL link in. It's going to give you a measurement ID. This is important for setting up your Google Tag Manager, which we'll get into in another video. Then you can also do enhanced measurement. So you want to make sure that the maximum is set for this. So you want to have as much enhanced measurement happening as possible. You can ignore modify events and custom events because that happens in the configure section. And this is a good way to double check if your uh, Google Tag Manager is connected or not. So if data is not flowing, that's a problem. Um, so let's click down on data settings and we're going to click on data collection. And so you want to be covering or collecting, sorry, uh, the maximum amount of data that you can legally obtain. So you can just go through this and make sure everything's filled out. Then for data retention, you want to make sure that you have this set for 14 months. The default is going to be two months, which means it's erasing all of your user and event data after two months, which can be really problematic, especially if you do quarterly or yearly reports. So please, 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 please make sure that you switch this to 14 months. I also recommend that you download all of your data and reports every year 
um, just so that you can keep that data over time. This is something that's new and it wasn't an issue with Universal Analytics. And then if we click on data filters, so typically the only data that you should be filtering out is internal traffic. Um, and you would just follow uh, the instructions and fill everything out, make sure it's active. So the only filter you really should have going on here is filtering out internal traffic. So Google Analytics doesn't need to be counting your uh, profile visits as a view or anything like that. So, or any of your employees, right? So internal traffic is typically the only filter you'll need here. You can also import data. Um, I wouldn't worry about this too, too much. You can also do reporting identity. Blended is the recommended, so I would keep it at that. But with that said, you have made it through to the end um, of this overview. So now we're gonna get into more of the reporting, how to analyze data. I'm gonna go into a different account and we can go ahead and look at the data that's there. And I will catch you on the next video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want access to all the videos for free, all you have to do is sign up for my IG Growth Accelerator course and you will find all those videos in the bonus section as well as some branded templates, DM scripts, and a whole bunch of helpful resources that can help grow your business.